Today we're doing some victory at sea and what I would like to start off talking about is turning this into some tournament play. So down the line there will be some tournaments eventually from this product and a couple of things have come to mind that just need to be sorted out. In first instance I would probably start to say that the rule of three is probably a good idea to enforce for a tournament that no more than three of one type or one class of ship or boat is uh, is allowed. You'll see how strong destroyers can be and they're very cheap. So limiting it to a class you sort of get three of each. You might still end up with 12 destroyers but at least it's not going to be 1500 points spammed of a 50 point model and they go out, do truckloads of damage, die really easily but in terms of pieces they get to exchange quite heavily in their favour. The other thing is that sometimes when you're dealing with the points you will have a disparity between the number of ships so some gaming systems use a pass mechanism which in a tournament is probably useful as well because you'll find that sometimes in a thousand point game you may have one or two ships as a difference and sometimes even more because as I said you've got destroyers and destroyers can make a lot of ships but you have one capital ship and that's clearly a lot of points by comparison what should be more effective and so on so this is just one of those things that the tournament organizers probably need to work out. I'm sure that uh, Warlord Games will have tournament packs. But as we go through, we'll have a look at something and decide how it all works. And what tournament organizers can do is up to them on an individual basis. So just saying, just throwing that out there, it's worth noting because that a points value game, like this is a great game, this is a good even game between forces but from a tournament point of view it can be skewed a little bit um, but that's again up to each individual tournament organizer between players doing their own thing that's different as well as with the um, uh, scenarios which are also a little bit different so that's all covered okay now on with the rest of it so after this if you like it subscribe and so on and I've got a patreon I'm trying to put together and so that way it can help bring out these a little bit more faster and so on and life gets in the way and generally time so I'm hoping to put a few things together but this is where we're going with the Warlord Games kit at the moment we're looking at some victory at sea and trying to run through some playthroughs all right as they say, let's get on with the show. This is the Japanese force. And what we're looking at here is 1,000 points. What's not represented by a card are fighters. So we'll, they'll just go on the board or they'll go by the side. But all of this, plus eight dive bombers, I should say, not fighters, but aircraft, that is what makes up 1,000 points in this force. What we have with us are two Fubuki class destroyers. We have two Megami class heavy cruisers. And we have an Akagi carrier. This purpose today is to look at aircraft, flights, fighters, and so on, dogfights, and dive bombs, runs, and so on. So it's going to be a little bit mismatched, they're not exactly the sort of power points plays you would expect between these two forces, but it's interesting to see what a thousand points can throw together. So on top of this you've got eight dive bombers with the, uh, from the Japanese. Over at the American side, yep, I've got the big banger. This is a thousand points, so we have a battleship. Pennsylvania class, a Portland class cruiser, a Northampton cruiser, two Clemsons, and going with the rule of three, we have three Fletchers. 
You'll notice on a destroyer how low their hull points are, but they can still dish out a reasonably ton of damage. So a little bit mismatched with their points, but in the open ocean, destroyers weren't that much use, really. They were anti-air, a little bit anti-sub, or mostly anti-air and anti-sub, in a points match where we're not really trying to make a, a balanced military force, we're just doing it for smashing our enemies against each other. Then this is what we do. So I would still stick with something like the Ruler 3, and in tournament play, probably no subs, but that's, and no motorboats, but that's again something that the tournament organizers might need to work out. This is the American force and we'll see what this looks like in their deployment zones. So it's worth noting that because we have an aircraft carrier and we have aircraft, we need to know which direction the wind is blowing. So we've already worked that out as well, which is, I'll point that out in a sec. So I've also just decided to make up my own deployment rules. And what I've done is from corner here to an equivalent corner to there. So it creates this triangle zone. What you need to be aware of is that with aircraft carriers, they have to be facing into the wind. So that is going to be our direction. In this instance, I've rolled it up and it's this edge along here is where the ship has to actually be facing. Meaning if we lined up along these shorter edges and you happen to be facing into your own climb zone backwards, you'll be going off the table, but not too long. So I didn't like that. Two of the aircraft could start out. And then we've got what we have here. So we've got our ships. Go and see the Americans. The other aircraft are on here and have to be deployed. At, well, if the, the carrier does nothing else but just launch fighters, then it are two fighters per round and they have to move at least one inch forward every round. Okay, let's see the Americans. This is the American fleet, and I did forget to mention that included in the thousand points were two fighters. As denoted by the F, and their class, of course, Wildcats. This is in effect the mission for the Japanese. And these are the Americans lined up in defense. Same sort of deal, they've got this one. And we've got all this open water in the middle here. There is a 30 inch range limitation for line of sight. And remember everything comes from where the bridge is located. So it's bridge to bridge. All right, now let's get moving. With initiative having been rolled, and I, sorry, I should have done that on camera, but the Japanese had won. So the, the Americans move first, but the Japanese will shoot first. So we'll pick a ship, and then we'll move across. Now this is one of those instances I was talking about where you've got Fletcher class destroyers, one, two, three, four, five for the Clemson, six, seven, eight on the battleship versus one, two, three, four, five. So whether you do the pass system where the Japanese player would have three passes and then can opt to flip them, let the other, the, the other side move again, that's something that the tournament organizers, and even just between friendlies, you'll just have to figure out. Otherwise, what ends up happening is the person with the most ships just ends up moving all of their ships last. So, we're just gonna stick with the traditional way, 
and we'll just move it from here. So the first ship to move is going to be a destroyer. They move seven inches forward. And then at the back, my destroyer, I've got a number three. What I should also have is which one of that that correlates to. So when it takes damage, we can put the cards and we can put the effects on here. Um, in this instance is going to be one, two, three, and one, two. Having moved one inch forward, the aircraft carrier then goes into the mode of launch fighters and launch the fighters to bring out an additional two. Now we go back to the Americans. We'll just run movement through and then we'll work it out in the next part after that. We move the American fleet. Everyone moved up and a few angle changes. The Japanese have moved up. Most of the Japanese fleet being a little bit faster, move up and faster again. So once we've done all the ships, and everyone is about 42 inches away or 44 inches away, which is not close enough to do anything. 30 inches is a line of sight. If you're playing with the uh, spotter planes that come with these, then effects can include already having certain ships pegged as line of sight. You just need range. So the bigger battleships generally have a much longer range. But anyway, so we've got our ships here. That's moved and that's up. So now it's time to do the aircraft. So what the Japanese do, they can say, Americans move your aircraft first. And they have to move all their aircraft, not just one unit. Any aircraft, they all have to move at the same time. It's handy to have a cheat sheet with your fighters on it, so that way you can just refer to how fast they go. These Wildcats travel at 23 inches, and unlike ships, they don't just move in one direction, they can move anywhere within a bubble of that 23. The valves moving a bit slower, just consolidated up to form a line, getting ready for a push. All right, now it's to initiative. No one's in range of cannon fire. No one has line of sight or in range, so we move on to initiative and then it's the next round. Initiative, Japanese being the orange. And the Americans win it this round, getting the Japanese player to make the first move. Moving the aircraft forward and putting a couple more, oh sorry, moving the aircraft carrier forward, the Akagi forward and putting a couple more aircraft carrier, aircraft on the board. And now it's back to the action. Just to remind people how turning happens, we've moved up a little bit. Now it's time to move. After all the ships have moved, the aircraft are yet to move still. The Japanese are angled like this. The Americans taking a defensive posture. Thus, there's the USS Arizona. And we're off. So we'll move the aircraft. The American player says, Japan, move your aircraft first. And we'll take it from there. The US playing with a fighter screen. Destroyers to the battleship. The attacking bombers. Lining up. And we're good for the next round. Japanese round. Let's go. 
This time around, the quality check, sorry, I forgot to also mention that you have to do a quality check to do a scramble for your fighters. This time it failed, so only one fighter got launched, leaving one more fighter left to come on through. We haven't moved the fighters yet, but these are lined up here, is lined up, the fighters just need to move. At this stage, the two Megamis with their mighty powerful range can target the two destroyers and two of the uh, Fletcher or the a Fletcher and a Clemson destroyer. So measuring it up from bridge to bridge. 30 inches bridge to bridge. And the same deal on that one. But nothing else is in range. But the fighters still have to move. Wildcats versus the Vowels. So we'll do a firing solution, figure out whether or not it's worth firing from these into the enemy ships, because they're small, they've moved fast, and their destroyers, it'll be interesting. Let's go. So looking at the Megamis, they're at extreme range, well the uh, destroyers are at extreme range, they are uh, also a destroyer which makes them a little bit smaller and they move fast, which is six inches or more. That puts them at a minus uh, four on the attack dot. So needing an eight, yeah, that ain't gonna happen. So on a D6, roll of a D6, needing an eight, they're not gonna happen. See, the way that it works is you roll the D6, you need to score a four plus. Then on that dice roll, you have the modifiers for range, which affects the dice roll and the size of the target and how fast the target moved. Also what you're attacking with if it's torpedoes and so on. But the, the, the uh, dice roll, you could flip it around and add to that number. So from a four, so you need a four plus on a D6. Extreme range is a plus two, meaning it's a six. Destroyer is a plus one making it a seven, and then they move fast, which is another plus one, taking it to eight. Either way, that's how it works. And they cannot, because they are not, everyone's just a bit too fast, a bit too small, and a bit too far. Okay, time for initiative, let's go. Now we're getting into some pointy bits of the action. And the Americans have the oh so important initiative. The air enemy aircraft carrier, or the Japanese aircraft carrier, has launched its final fighter. The American aircraft, uh, the American battleship, moved. And this is 30 inches, which is the sight, which puts us roughly about here. from the battleship armaments. All right, let's go. Japanese to move. After all the movement. We have the Indianapolis here, Chicago over here. Arizona, various destroyers in the front line. The aircraft are about to move. And this is where the American player can decide to say, okay, Japanese aircraft move first, we'll intercept, or we'll move ours into some of the targets and holding them back. 
keep in mind we've got ships nearby okay and we're off with the next step it's important to note that the Fubuki class destroyers let me just flip over to the character card You'll see that uh, the light guns, whilst they have a range, they're not dual purpose. You cannot use them to attack enemy aircraft with them. But they do have the AA batteries which give them an extra point. But still, when you have light guns that can be dual purpose, you've got a little bit of additional space to be able to try and shoot down some enemy aircraft. These Japanese destroyers, these ones here particularly, do not have that. Alright. And we're moving back. The Megamis do. Let's go. Both the Fletcher and the Clemson class are in range of that ship, or that aircraft. All of these are in range of that, as well as some of these others. And we have two dogfights which happen pretty much instantaneously. And today is a good day to be firing. All right, let's go. So we'll deal with the aircraft first and go from there. The US get to resolve their shooting first because they force the Japanese to move, so it's time to go. Okay, so the Wildcat and the Val, blue being the Wildcat. So they're equal. The Wildcat gets a bonus because it's a fighter, and there's a negative as applied here, meaning that the Wildcat has won that combat. We'll look at the second combat. The Wildcat has a plus two on their attack, which brings this up to three. And that has a negative, which drops the three. So again, the fighter wins, knocking out two of the Japanese aircraft. In range of the ship, of, from the Fletcher class to the Val, we're looking for sixes. And we don't get any. The local bonus and AA bonuses only apply if the aircraft fly over or fly adjacent to. So land next to it. Or fly next to it. And now the Clemson. Nope. On that as well. The Mogami class ships against the uh, one of the fighters so the Megamis have a lot more firepower so let me get that ready so the first Megami not a six to be seen second Megami Nope. And then, as we said before, we do not have the ability from the Japanese destroyer to do the, the dual purpose guns. The Indianapolis firing arc means that the front guns are able to go after the Kamano whereas the rear guns are able to go versus the Megami. The Indianapolis in the front with two guns firing at 
the Kamano. So that's at long range, which means that the 4 plus to hit now becomes a 5 plus. And it was a fast chip, so they need 6s. And no. And the Portland class, because they only get um, one attack dice. Sorry, my mistake. Okay, so the Portland class of the Indianapolis is firing the front guns at Mano, which is uh, three dice per, per big gun, per gun, meaning that we've got six dice. They need a four plus to hit normally, and they're having a minus one applied to the dice roll for long range and minus one for the speed of the enemy ship. Which results in one being hit. The damage dice for the Portland is one and we're looking at an armor value of three plus and a six is the critical. Inflicts one damage. So the, we take this down to 29, slide that over to the nine and they go from 30 to 29. Okay. With no other effects. Rear guns, firing Megami, three attack dice. Nope. initiative and we roll again because they're equal Americans go first another instance where from a ton point of view you could say whoever if it's an equal whoever had it last time doesn't get it but that's again tournament organizer so what we have here is the next round all sorted out. We've got the Arizona at the back, Chicago in a nice firing position on pretty much everything on the board. Indianapolis able to broadside, torpedoes, whatever we want to unload. We have the same deal with these destroyers. We're about to move the aircraft and then it's getting down to business. In a savage state of affairs, we have dogfights, and we have three bombers that made it to the Arizona. So now it's time for starting to fire on things. The Americans get to pick Let's go. Dogfight one. Because the, this is a six, because it's a negative two, this is got a positive number applied to it, balances out and just loses the dogfight. Dogfight number two. And the fighters win out again. So the Arizona gets two dice roll. It's two dice for its anti-air, as it is completely surrounded. They're all on it. So the anti-air component comes in. Top of that, you've got all of the light guns that are capable. Not all the guns are, but these ones 
have some. So that's this many dice. So we're talking about eight dice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Requiring sixes. And of all of that, one, six. Okay, so we're within four inches. Torpedoes here. The Clemson rolls five dice for the attack. Still needing that four plus, but with all of the other modifiers coming into play. We're looking at sixes being required. We got one. The damage dice is three. And this is the total of what we're doing with the, the, the damage. With fives and sixes potentially being crits. So that's 14 damage, and then on a crit, no crit. So 14 damage to the ship. So the ship is now suddenly reduced to 16, and dangerously close to being in a critical zone when it hits 10. Just to move it along a little bit, we've got the two Val with one attack dice each. On a three plus they hit with one hitting. With a devastating attack, on a five single dice roll, five or a six is a crit. And doing six damage with the potential for a crit. And the other, that's for a, a crit, which does a different set of damage. For the crit, rolling a d10, it's a three, which is the engine. And because it's devastating, it does three. Category three on the engine. Turbine damage, minus one flank. Crew area critical score is increased by one, which does an additional damage, taking a total of seven. So it's important to know that the crew area, which is this one here, the crit increases by one for the Arizona, which means that we're at this level here, which means that we're at minus one attack dice, and then we have to check for all the weapons to see what exactly happens um, and which ones are affected, which uh, systems are affected by the attack dice. And as it takes damage, sometimes these, zone, these scores increase with every level. And then you've got further effects such as additional damage or further effects along the way. This is where we're at in the engine and this is where we're at with the crew so we'll mark that on the characters on the uh, record sheet uh, on the card so over here what we have is the arizona with the damage and taken and with the three engine crits the one crew crit just to keep as a reminder we've reduced the damage so we've just gone from 72 to 65. For the missile fire, also for the torpedo fire, I've just used one of the rearm tokens to show that the system has been used. And same too with the aircraft. The difference being the torpedoes off a destroyer are one shot and then they can't be rearmed, but I just needed something to uh, mark as a token just to say the weapon system wasn't being used. And here, 
when these ship when these aircraft return back to the aircraft carrier they can actually rearm and then re-enter play as brand new dive bombers which is always good so that's that we've done we've just got the Japanese firing to go we've still got a couple of aircraft that haven't been engaged and we are able to continue. So it's time to do some firing from the Japanese side into the American side. So I still had some US firing arcs to, to deal with first. So we've done the Fletcher class. Now the Clemson class that's down this end is just out of reach for its missiles, uh, for its torpedoes. Going from bridge to bridge, it's just a bit of an inch out, so that's enough to say that it's too far out. And it's not in the firing arc to be able to fire the other one. Um, it'll have some light gun action on something. We have some light gun action happening with the other one, other destroyers against probably that and um, we'll have some Chicago and Indianapolis firing around seeing what they can hit and in response we have some attacks coming from the Fabukis into the destroyers of any sort and the Megami gets to return fire Mano turns fire and potentially yep the uh, yep gets to fire on as well so we're all good at firing we also get to fire some light guns at extreme range from the Akagi into one of these as well so it gets nice spread of fire across the board we still have two aircraft left and then which can't attack anything but are just there you never know something still might happen starting with the destroyers first we have the Clemson light guns Going shooting out. And that's requiring obviously the 4 plus. It's in um, short range. Just needed to double check the light guns get to ignore fast moving for ships, which is what the Japanese cruisers they're all move they they're moving seven inches which is gives them the the, uh, the fast moving ship roll meaning it hits so they get one shot in with the light guns now we roll for the damage which is at minus two and the damage die is just the one so the one hits with a minus two applied onto this and they've got to get no nope. Oh, well, it doesn't matter, but in effect, the dice roll minus two had to be a three plus to be able to get into to um, strike at the, the Japanese cruiser. So the next shot from there is another Clemson against the Japanese destroyer. So that's two. And that is also at short range. So that's two of those hit. And needing a one, natural ones, no. The natural ones on the damage die always miss. That's just one of the rules that's always applied. 
if no matter if you've got um, whatever pluses you have to your dice roll a natural one will always miss so the curse of the base dice for this <laughs> the starter pack is continuing see Fletcher onto the same dest Japanese destroyer so the Fletcher fires three and needing four pluses no that's not working either the next Fletcher firing onto the Megami that's one hit and that's no damage so lots of shrapnel firing out in there in the space some of it clinging some of it just not getting through at all and others just firing wildly missing everything we'll size up the big guns and we'll see what we've got left so the chicago can only fire in the front arc and its a and b guns are aiming at the Mogami which has already taken the torpedo hit and is seriously injured we're at long range let's go needing sixes because we've got a fast ship and we're looking at a uh, long range now we're at long range which means that when we roll for our damage we get an additional one on our check so the big guns each hit all right so that's one die with a plus one for the torrent of fire and they need a three plus so any result not a one does one damage all right so we've got the a and b guns up against from the indianapolis to the kamano needing a six and we have one six we now roll for damage which is a plus one torrent of fire because it's at long range and the torrent of fire is just, is for the big guns firing at long range um, because they're they're coming down rather than straight across the bow or straight at and we've got a two which goes to a, with a plus one torrent of fire and there's no other armor piercing value which takes it to three and that is the result needed to be able to do one point of damage the Indianapolis can fire its rear guns into the Megami hitting once again long range tyrant of fire plus one and that's also a crit so what we'll do now is we'll check for a crit take one damage check for a crit and it's a critical the Megami a five and a five is weapons so we move over to weapons and now we've got one attack or one uh, level one damage and it does one additional damage so now it's two damage in total and it receives minus one attack dice which we have to check with every weapon system so the Megami has now down to 13 with its critical hole being 10 so we're um, coming quite close to being very damaged in this ship and we've got our token to say that the weapon's been hit once it's easier just to do it once we start firing as to who gets affected and then we can make a, a note or a marker next to each of the weapons 
as they get done. The Arizona is not in range of any of these. And now it's the response of the Japanese onto the Americans. Might as well do the, um, the damage cruise now for the Arizona and the Megami. So we roll a d6 on a one to three. We lose the attack dice. In this case, it's just minus one for both ships onto all light gun systems. If this dice roll is a four or a five, it's from the AA battery. And if it's a six, then all torpedoes will lose a, an attack dice. For the Arizona, the AA battery is reduced by one. Megami, the light guns are reduced by one. Okay, so first we'll do the Megami into one of the Fletchers using the light guns and it's minus one dice, so we're down to five instead of the six. And we need sixes to hit with the light guns. In this case, we do one. So the light guns have a minus two on the AP and the destroyers are a one plus. So it needs to be higher than three, and it doesn't fails to wound the destroyer. Okay, so the Megami firing onto the Indianapolis with only in the front forward arc gets the benefit of the ship being in silhouette as it attacks. It's coming in from here attacking the ship into the side giving it the silhouette and that's a plus one on the hit it's a long range which is a minus one and there are no other modifiers it didn't move more than six so it does not get a fast ship and now we're rolling we need to roll fours or higher with six dice as it's two dice per gun and it's got an ABC can ABC guns all firing. These hit here and now we need to roll on a three plus and we're on our way with a plus one from plunging fire. Not those two, so that's two and a crit, or potential crit. So that's three damage, crit, and that's a crit. On the crit chart is a nine, which is the crew, and we mark that on the no feather effect, so it's three damage, crew crit, and where they get the minus one attack dice to their sec their uh, weapon systems. All right, that's the Megami. Let's make those adjustments. The Kamano fires ABC into the Indianapolis. Same deal, long range, but it doesn't get the silhouette bonus. So three hits, plunging fire plus one, three plus high to get for three damage. Right, so the rear of the Kamano gets to fire into the Chicago. For one, plunging fire. and it damages it for one damage. The Akagi gets to fire its light guns at extreme range, but because of the restricted rule, it only fires, uses three, against port and starboard targets, and you're at half 
your um, local your um, your light gun range, your light gun um, attack, and we're firing. Oh, we get one. It's nice. Surprise. And we wound. So we roll a three. It's at minus two, which is a one, which is the same as the destroyer's armor of one plus. So yes, that is a hit for one damage. With everyone that can fire having fired, we're now up to initiative. Tide result. Japanese, they get to seize the initiative. With the Japanese seizing initiative, the Arizona moves. The way that ships move when they're in base to base contact and all of that, you move the other models just around it's not a. Um, it, it's not like that. You can. You can't even ram anything as such. If two ships collide, they simply just move around into locations to that fit roughly where they're going. Whilst these are scaled to a degree, what they represent is a smaller dot in a much larger ocean, and especially these are aircraft. So we leave these roughly where they were, but when we move. And that's a three inch move in total, by the way. It did two inch move forward, then a 45 degree turn. And it doesn't really amount to much. But it's all that she's got. So that's the US. Next is the Japanese move, which will be the Akagi. And then we'll start to move the other more capital ships. We'll get all the ships out of the way. Then we'll move the aircraft. Arizona, Chicago, Indianapolis, two Wildcats, Fletcher, Clemson, Clemson, Fabuki, Kamano, the Megami Cruiser, Megami, the Megami Cruiser, Fabuki class. Couple of valves left and the Akagi. So, after everyone's moved, we still have to move the ships, oh, sorry, the aircraft. We've got some pretty tight parking space around the middle here. The American destroyers getting right into the thick of it positioning themselves for some very fine torpedo activity. The Akagi, Chicago, Indianapolis, and the Arizona. The end phase of the previous turn, we check to see which ships can repair in what systems. So the weapon system on the Mogami can be checked. It's got one level of damage on the weapon and the Arizona has three on the engine, one on the crew, which includes damage one on the weapons. Oh, it's not, not so much on the weapons, but so it's um, just on the crew. One on the crew and one on the, and three on the engine. Sorry, three on the engine and one on the crew, and it's one on the weapons for the Megami. You roll a d6 for one system, and that system allows you just for one. You can only pick one, and then you make a roll. And on a for every point over four, it's reduced by one. So if you roll um, if you roll a six you reduce the score by two and so on there is an order that you can do that allows you to all hands on deck and try to repair every system 
which is probably fine for most of the criticals. But in this instance, we've just got some minors, so it, it's not so bad. Now, the um, Arizona's were attempt attempted to repair the engine and failed. The Megami repairs the weapons and succeeds. So the Megami has full access to its weapons again. It can't improve its hull. The, the amount of um, hit points or the hull is still 13, dangerously close to that 10, but it can fire and make use of all the weapons this round. Whereas the Arizona is unable to. Still running on three, which is what we did. I just forgot to check the end system before. So now it's time for the aircraft to move, and this is where initiative becomes really important. The valves move 15 inches, which mean, and the Japanese have chosen to do their movement first, which means that this can move against this one, locking it up, and this one can move onto this one, locking it up. However, this vowel also makes a flight path directly over the Chicago, which means that uh, the Chicago gets to use its anti-aircraft to see if it shoots it down. On the flip side, this gets to attack, do a dive bombing run on the Chicago and this one down here can move up or can attack to attack one of the destroyers when you're engaged with air to air combat you're immediately locked and that's that's it and then we resolve it later all right Let's move the aircraft. So the Megami is going to fire first and it is firing as a broadside all into the Chicago and able to unleash all sorts of mayhem with 10 attack dice. And those dice, whoops a daisy, requiring a four plus, and then because it's in silhouette, it's a plus one to the attack, meaning three plus. So taking out all the ones and twos, They are the hits. The damage dice is still one per dice. It's a short range, so there's no torrent of fire. Just having to beat the, well, not roll a one, because it's a two plus armor. And sixes are a critical. That was like four ones, by the way. The Megami continuing its assault, firing on a nearby destroyer, only able to fire half its attack dice because it's a restricted weapon and it's in the um, uh, starboard arc. And we're point blank range, which gives us that one. And it's at minus two, no, ineffective. 
The Megami is still continuing its assault. It's firing its port side torpedoes, all of them, into the Indianapolis. And that's it. Short range, their torpedoes, which gives means that it only on sixes that does it hit. And we're rolling six dice. Torpedoes on the cruisers are slow loading, which means that they fire this round, they have to rearm next round, and then they get to fire the round following. Looking for a six. And we get one. We get one. If the ship was in silhouette, we would have got a, another one, but we did not. Or at point blank range. The damage dice on the torpedoes are three, so because one hit, we roll three dice. Inflicting 3d6 damage, and on a five or a six, we're looking at criticals, potential criticals. So that's nine damage in total to the Indianapolis. The Portland Cruiser, or the Indianapolis, is currently on 11 hull. 8 puts it in critical zone. But aside from that, she's mostly unharmed. Just lots of holes. The Northampton, the Chicago, is down to 19. with the uh, crew cleared up from the end phase last round. And that's the Arizona. And we've got our destroyers. Being small and fast is a major, major benefit across the board. The reason for doing the Megami first is that the uh, first ship to fire from the American side is a destroyer with dropping five torpedoes into the side of the Megami. So the torpedoes requiring the four plus like normal but modified by a two because they're torpedoes. Then the ship move fast but they're also at point blank range and so on. So what we've got is um, requiring four plus two for torpedoes goes to six plus one because it was a fast target goes to seven uh, minus one for point blank range which is back to six that's yeah, the best that a uh, torpedo can usually hope for is point blank range and against a relatively slow target torpedoes are good so the five torpedoes all requiring or any six and we get to roll for the damage. So what we hit with was with one six. Now because it's got a damage dice of three, that one hit allows us to roll three dice. The Megami has 13 hull, and on a five or a six, we're looking at potential crits. So that's nine damage. Nine damage onto the Megami, dropping it down to four and putting it well and truly into a critical zone. So what's so bad about it being a critical first is the lumbering trait, which means that it makes it one direction change only during the movement. It cannot use the evade order, which might be useful. Crippled ships also means that your movement is halved and your attacking dice of light guns, torpedoes and AA systems will be halved, rounding down. What we also need to do is roll a d4 for each main gun and 
any other trait that the ship may possess, like agile and so on. And then on a 4+, plus, it's rendered inoperable and cannot be used again for the game. So it's not good, not good at all. So in case you want to know what I rolled... So, all forward facing turrets are inoperable for the rest of the game. And only for surviving with the rear turrets. And we no longer have Agile. Flank speed is now down to 3. AA and light guns are at half. Torpedoes at half. And we have 4 hull points left. Okay, so now the Fabuki's firing, one of the Fabuki's is firing light guns into the um, torps, torp firing ship that just hit the Megami. And because it was in point blank range, two hit, minus two, and only one damage. Keeping a track of who's fired can get kind of tricky once you get lots and lots of ships all doing their bit. And so I just put little markers next to them. Some of you may recognize these markers. But um, anyway, so next, Indianapolis, full frontal. Let's see if we can finish off the Megami. So with uh, Six attack dice for the big guns. It's attacking a silhouetted Megami at short range. So here we go. Fours. Going to threes, going back. So that's three hits. This definitely signals the end of the Megami, one would imagine. Right, it's got four hit points left. And the guns each do one. We're doing three plus. So for two hull points of damage. Two damage. It's still limping about. The... Um, Mano broadsiding point blank range to the Indianapolis. So with that, we need threes, taking out ones and twos. These are all the hits. And each hit is for one. So what have we got? We've got one crit. One, two, three, four with a crit. And there we go. So let's check that crit. And we don't. So four damage. So the Indianapolis is now down to seven, which puts it below the critical. Having rolled, we now lose one turret. And the guns and battery are also reduced. And speed is halved. So now we have the battleship Arizona going full guns against Kamano. So that's four plus long range plus moving fast, which takes up to six, but the commando's in silhouette. So now we're rolling 12 dice and hitting on fives. So that's for five plus. So let's take these out. Tyrant of Fire is plus one. Now the damage dice on these are three per hits. So those three go to nine. Now 
9 damage dice against the Kamano and anything except the natural one will do it. Six as being a crit, potential crit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight with a potential crit. Eight damage with a potential crit. And it's a crit. In the weapon system. Which minus one attack dice, and we're good to go. Fast forwarding a little bit, the uh, we finished the round. We're about to do done with two dog fights. We're won by the fighters. No surprise. We've just got the two dive bomb attempts there. The Megami finally went down to one of the to everyone who's fired has fired, and taking their shots, so there's a big hole where the Megami used to be. So now we've got our dive bombers. It's on a three plus versus the Chicago, which is a hit. D6 for damage, and on a five or a six, it's a crit. So two damage to the Chicago. And for the destroyer, that's a hit and destroyed. So that's number three, which has already got six hull. So that six was enough, but then did it crit. It also crit in area number two, which is the engine. And it did a full explosion with an additional that much damage. That's what one bomb could do. That, that's pretty impressive. And torpedoes have a similar sort of power as that. So anyway, all right, so that's the um, Fletcher three out and the Megami. I don't know if that's quite an even swap, but we'll uh, move on from there. This is probably the last round, but we've done all the movement. We haven't moved the aircraft yet, but we've got Everyone death knelling everything. So we've got the Indianapolis and the Chicago, Kamano, Japanese destroyer, two American destroyers, two American destroyers, Japanese destroyer, and Arizona. The Japanese destroyer, uh, Japanese cruiser, Kamano was able to get back its light weapons, but none of the other criticals were removed from the ships. I will run through combat, we'll do all that, and then we'll come back once we're ready for um, some notables. All right, so we started to combat, and the Kamano launched a bunch of Torpedo salvos into the Chicago. Two hit, which means six dice rolls. This is how much it takes, and fives and sixes are crits. So it takes in total 16, 19, 20, 21 damage, which is enough to destroy it anyway. But then it's got some three crits, just for the sake of the crits. The two. So this is definitely the last round and we'll call it after this. This ship during move, this plane during movement made it back to there, so that way I can stay on here and rearm, refuel, whatever. These two fired which just caused it to lose a hull point. We know that the fighter is going to destroy that. We did some light anti light gunfire and we did some God Almighty torpedo damage 
you'll notice that there's a big hole the Kamano used to live that's why so the um, even if the Indianapolis takes some damage which it's unlikely to take complete damage enough to, to sink it it's down to one hit point like one hull point it's it's down but it's just whether or not that can actually do enough damage and hit the distance on that plus it's torpedoes is already putting it at an extreme range so you're looking at like a lot of damage like a lot of um, it's not gonna actually be able to hit I think sixes and then yeah so even if that goes down you've still got that and we've got a couple of destroyers here that are um, still about but they've only got five hull points each I think one only has four hull points left so all in all Torpedoes by destroyers does a lot of damage, which is one of the reasons why we're talking about that in terms of the uh, what the tournament organizers need to do. All right, well, we're good here. I think I've shown how most things work. We're up to, um, what's the point of battleships? Well, that did a lot of damage. Where aircraft are good if you've got air superiority. I'd like to thank everyone for st sticking around, staying tuned. Hopefully it's not too painful. Hopefully you got an idea about how the game runs. We've still got a few elements to put through, but we'll get to them as we move down. So, uh, just like to um, say thank you again. Like, subscribe. I really do appreciate all of my Patreons. I know that it's tough, especially when content doesn't come out regularly, but we'll keep going. All right, thanks guys. Thanks lasses, lads, and God bless everyone of every military nation, I guess. I don't know. But um, you got to feel for these people. There's a lot of punishment being dished out and being taken. And it's actually not as close as it looked. It might look close. But we've just got a lot of firepower from torpedoes. So anyway. Alright. Thanks very much. Signing off. Alright. Bye.